So, setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul, and after she was baptized, and her household as well. She urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore their garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer cried with a loud voice, I'm sorry, and the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced, along with his entire household, that he had believed in God. Well, good morning, church. And many of you know that I, I love history. Uh, one of my degrees is in history, and I typically have a history book of some kind that I am reading. That that's what I do for fun and uh, leisure. And uh, here's what I'm thinking I've, I know, that if you get a bunch of, for example, European history buffs together, and you ask them to identify the most critical moment in European history in the last, say, 2,000 years that shaped its future, you will get a furious, furious debate. And all kinds of you know, suggestions are going to be thrown out, and they're going to argue back and forth passionately about their choice, right? Somebody is going to talk about the fall of Rome. Somebody is going to talk about uh, probably the Battle of Tours in 732 when Charles, Charles Martel stopped the, the spread of Islam in Europe and, and the Islamization of Europe, and a very, very important uh, event in European history. Somebody might bring up the, the Edict of Milan when Constantine made, made Christianity the, the uh, religion, the official religion of the Roman Empire. Uh, you know, 
somebody might bring up uh, the Black Death, you know, and the plague and how it entered into Europe. Or maybe someone will talk about an era like the Enlightenment or the Reformation. Uh, you, you could make the case for a decade, like the 1450s. And in just a few years, you had the invention of the printing press. Think about how the, the printing press has changed Europe and the entire world, right? And, and how that affected everything. And then a couple of years later, you had the fall of Constantinople and all that was involved in that. And then the Ottoman Empire, I mean, just incredible in just, you know, 1450 to 1453, just those three years in, in European history, in, incredible time. Or, you know, jump, jump forward to the first half of the 20th century. I mean, many of us yes, are, are aware of these events and the, and the two world wars that take place there. But here's what you won't hear anyone argue. Here's what you won't hear anybody argue, but, but what you probably should hear argued, that the most significant event, turning point in European history, actually occurred around 50 AD, when, a, with a quiet invasion that was led by two Jewish men and two Gentile men. Two guys, four guys total. Paul and Silas, Timothy and Luke, they got into a boat in Troas. They left the Asian continent. They sail across the Aegean Sea. They made the 150 mile journey in two days, which was incredibly fast. When they go back the other way, it takes them five days. So apparently God was definitely wanting them to go from east to west. They make it in two days. They land in Neapolis, Greece and walk 10 miles inland to Philippi, a major city on the major highway connecting the entire Roman Empire east to west. And they stay there for at least a few weeks and they end up planting the first of several churches on the European continent. And I would suggest to you that that is actually the most significant turning point in European history. And I don't say that because I'm a Christian, I say that because of what ends up happening. It's a different kind of invasion that begins, that starts with this first church plant of all Europe that will ultimately be replicated and spread throughout the entire continent that will then be conquered by the gospel. Think about how the history of Europe is radically changed. Think about how the history of the world is radically changed because Europe is Christianized and becomes so devoted to the gospel. Even when it's corrupted in the dark ages and in the medieval ages, think about how the world is changed. Think about how our own nation is shaped and affected by the fact that this event happens in 50 AD, setting off the chain of events where Europe becomes a Christian continent, downstream events, the ancestors of these people whose churches are planted come to America and our own country. Truly the kingdom of God, right? It's like that little mustard seed that Jesus talks about. Something starts out so insignificant that nobody pays any attention to, so small, right? But then it blossoms and it grows and such small beginnings for the European continent. And it's all here in this chapter, in Acts chapter 16. But getting here was tough, very difficult. And, and you can probably relate to this. Have you ever had one of those times in your life where you're, maybe you're trying to serve God, you're, you're, you're trying to grow in your faith, you're trying to share your faith, perhaps, win someone to Christ in your family, you're, you're trying to participate in a ministry, maybe it's take a missions trip, or it's trying to grow something, even in our church that you've participated in, or you're trying to discover God's will for your life, and no matter what you do, it just seems like obstacle after obstacle after obstacle, failure after failure after failure. Nothing seems to be working right. Everything just seems to be going backwards. Nothing is working out like you wanted it to. You ever had that happen in your life? I have. I have. Numerous different times. 
And you pray and you pray and you seek God's will and his guidance, and it's just like nothing. That's actually what's been happening to Paul and Silas and Timothy. You know, Paul and Silas, they start the second missionary journey. Remember last week we talked about the Jerusalem council. At the end of that council, Paul and Barnabas, that dynamic duo, they're gonna go out again on a second missionary journey and they have a disagreement, a dispute. They're not able to solve it, unlike the council, and they split up and it's over whether or not to take John Mark with them. Incredible story there. So Paul and Silas, two Jewish guys, rabbis, they go out, they revisit the churches that were planted in the first missionary journey. They strengthen them, they build them back up, they're, they're making sure that they're healthy. Along the way, in one of those churches, they meet this young man by the name of Timothy, who will become Paul's protege. He is the, the, the son of a Gentile father and a Jewish mother. And so they, they begin to go across Asia Minor, the very western edge of the Asian continent. And their intention is to go to these different cities and preach the gospel. And everywhere they try to go and preach, it doesn't work out. And they continue to make their way across the continent. And again, failure after failure, obstacle after obstacle, they get to a, a critical juncture and it seems like they're, they're gonna take the, they're gonna take I-95 south. Right? And they're going to go to Ephesus. And all of these cities that you see in Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3, the churches that are mentioned in the book of Revelation, which haven't been planted yet. And they're going to go down there and they're going to plant churches and spread the gospel. And, and they're blocked. God doesn't let them go. And so, okay, well, we can't go south and we definitely need, know that the north needs the gospel. So let's go north, right? And so they start trying to go north. And again, it's blocked. No, we don't know why it's blocked. We don't know how it's blocked. We're just told that the, that the Holy Spirit won't let them get there. And so all of their plans just keep getting frustrated. So finally, they, they, they're just going, and they, they, now they don't have anywhere to, they're in Troas. They're at the, the far western end of the Asian continent. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's the ocean, that's it. Now they're at the Aegean Sea. And I love that portion of the story. And, and the reason why is it just kind of gives us insight, church. A little, little piece of encouragement there. When you go and you don't know what's happening and you're trying to discern God's will, sometimes God works in our lives first by closing doors and shutting down options and funneling us until he finally gives us the positive direction. And that's what he does to Paul here in Troas with what is known as the Macedonian call. He has this vision from God, come over to Macedonia, the, the birthplace of Alexander the Great, the Southern Balkans, Northern Greece area, there in Troas. And verse 10, Luke, and he starts using the pronoun we, because in Troas, they meet Dr. Luke. Uh, maybe he's there on vacation, we don't know. Apparently, uh, uh, Luke may be from Philippi. And uh, because at the end of Acts 16, he goes back to they. He stays apparently in Philippi after what occurs here. And so apparently he meets Paul and Troas and he, and he joins up with them. And his narrative of what happens in Philippi is really important. You know, we're going to have Holy Weeks. We start Holy Week next week. And, and Brian is going uh, to bring the message on Palm Sunday. And then we have Easter. So we're, we'll, be, we'll be taking a break from Acts. But when we come back... We're not going to look at every church and every story that is planted, or every church that's planted in every story that takes place from here on out in the book of Acts. We're going we're to be wrapping up our study of the book of Acts in, in the month of May. And, and the reason why is because this story right here in Philippi, it's, it's kind of instructive, important. This beachhead for the invasion of God's kingdom in Europe, it illustrates how the gospel will change lives, how churches will be planted in the rest of the book of Acts and in the centuries to come, in the millennia to come, in our own day right now, and probably long after us until Jesus comes. 
And so we're not gonna repeat the same stories over and over again for the rest of the book of Acts. We're gonna hit a few of the highlights and we'll finish the book. And then throughout the summer months of May and, and throughout the summer months, we have a, a serious plan from the Old Testament, okay? So that's where we're kind of going. But this morning, we're gonna look at this beachhead, this invasion of Europe. And let's start by looking at the details of three significant salvation stories. Starts with a wealthy merchant lady. In verse 13, on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who had heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and after her household was as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord and come to my house, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Now, why were these women down at the river? Um, Philippi is a major city. And you know, Paul's, his, his typical modus operandi when he went into a city was to go to the synagogue and preach in a synagogue. But Philippi did not have a synagogue. To have a synagogue, you had to have uh, at least 10 Jewish families where the head of the household was a man. And Philippi apparently did not have 10 households where the where Jewish households, where there was a man who was the head of the household. So the law instructed Jewish people in a city, if you did not have a synagogue, go outside of the city, find perhaps a, a river or a lake, some, some quiet place, preferably by a body of water, and you would pray together and you would read the law, talk about God's word together and worship together before going back into the city. And so that's why these women are there. And that's why Paul and Silas, they go outside the city on the Sabbath looking maybe for some other Jewish people or people who are following the way of Judaism. And they meet this woman, Lydia, and some other women. We're told she's the seller of purple fabrics, her city of Thyatira. It's known for its purple dyes. Very hard to do. It's a hard process, uh, very complicated, very rare, extremely valuable, extremely expensive in the ancient world. And they kind of had the corner of the market. You know, they, they were the guys. They were the ones who got to supply the, the dyes that went throughout the Mediterranean world. And so this woman, Lydia, and it's possible that she was like the lady from Lydia, that this was her business name. This was how she was known in the, the area. Lydia was a province. Thyatira was the city within the province of Lydia. And so it's very possible that she's the lady from Lydia. And, but we're going to call her Lydia, okay, just for shorthand. Who knows? We'll find out from heaven. Maybe her name was Lydia, from the province of Lydia. Who knows? Right? It's very likely she was a widow. Maybe she had taken over her husband's business. Here's what you know. She had some coin. She was, she was wealthy. She had a nice, she had a house big enough to host the church there. Uh, and because this dye, it, it, the people who were able to buy the purple fabrics and the clothing that was made with purple and the other draperies and things like this, this was royalty. This was the color of royalty. This was the color of aristocracy. This was the color that you wore to tell everybody I'm loaded. Okay, that's what this was. And so the commissions, she, she was the, you know, Rodeo Drive merchant. That's who she was. So she had money, and she's a Gentile who believes in God, but she hasn't converted to Judaism. And in a, a real sense, she's like Cornelius in Romans chapter 10. And God has been clearly drawing her to him. And it, on this Sabbath day, he sends Paul to proclaim the gospel to her. And as the scriptures say, on this day, God opens her heart. What another example that we have in the book of, of Acts, encouraging all of us 
to remember that commission that Jesus gives in Acts 1-8, encouraging us to obey it. Remember that commission. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. And again, like the Ethiopian eunuch, like Cornelius, like the Gentiles in Antioch of Pisidia, and now with Lydia, God is reminding us yet again that he is sovereign over salvation. Our role is to be a witness. God's role is to open the heart and to bring the harvest. And that's what happens on this day. He opens the heart of Lydia. He opens the hearts of those whom he's drawing to him. This is what Paul will remind the Corinthians, and he reminds us, he says to them, I planted the seed. Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Our commissioning church is not to produce the growth. Our commissioning is not to convince and drag people into the gates of heaven. Our commissioning is to bear witness, to plant the seeds, to water the seeds, to proclaim the good news. It's God's role to open the hearts of those he's drawing and to use the proclamation that we give to bring his children into the kingdom of God. Isn't it great that he does not put the burden on us to do the saving? Our role is to do the witnessing. So you have this merchant, wealthy merchant lady. What a great story. And then you have this bizarre story of the demon-possessed slave girl. As we were going to the place of prayer, now maybe it's that first Sabbath, maybe it's a few days later or the next Sabbath, but as we were going back to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing and doing and doing and doing. That's the underlying language there. She was repeatedly doing this for many days. Paul, having had his fill of this, again, that's what's being said, became greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and it came out that very hour. Now listen, whenever we come across stories of demonic possession in the Bible, there's always people in an audience or who listen who are skeptical. I always find that confusing because we are so quick to want to believe about God, and we love to believe about God and angels, and God sends his angels to help us and to sustain us, and boy, I sure hope my angels are around, and we talk like this all the time, and then when it comes to demons, ugh, we want to explain it away. Oh, it's just mental illness, and they didn't know what to talk about. No. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's demon possession. There's fallen angels, those who rebel against God. There's forces of evil, principalities and powers that we fight and wrestle against, and it's real. It's still in our world. Maybe it's not as obvious as it was in that day, but in that day, it was certainly understood and known. Verse 16 says there was this spirit of divination. The Greek word here is puthon, and, and our word, like that would be python. And and that's intentional because in that part of the world, in the Greek world, Roman world, the god Apollos, and there was a symbol often attached to him, it was a snake, a python. Those of you who liked Greek history or maybe Homer and Iliad, the Odyssey, and okay, so who are the other two people in here who like that? Would you please raise your hand? Okay, there's, there's a few of us. Okay, there's like seven. So for the seven of us, the rest of you just check out for a second. So you seven, you remember the oracles of Delphi, you know, that temple where there was these women and and, and people would go to them throughout history. And okay, for the rest of you, you remember the 300 
and, and the, the movie to 300 and the battle to Spartans. And you remember King Leonides? And he, did, he went to the oracles of Delphi. Okay, now how many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay, now I get more of you, you pagans. Anyway, uh, <laughs> the oracles of Delphi were these women who were apparently in, in history, the historical records, you know, they, would, they were able to tell your future. And so kings would go to them and say, should I go to battle? Should I fight this war? Should I enter into this, tr- this treaty? And, and, and men would go and say, should I marry her or not marry her? Business people would go, should I enter into this, into this agreement and, and whatnot? And, and, and of course, they paid money for it. And, and, and the, these women would give you your fortune. And this was accepted. And by the way, it was kind of accurate. It was spooky what was going on here. So, so this was accepted. And the way this happened, that there was, there was women in this culture that would, uh, they, they were possessed. And they would enter into what was known as an ecstatic dance. This, is a, this was from a Greek pottery of that era. And here's this woman, she's involved in an ecstatic dance. And they would work themselves up and begin to whirl and get into such a state where they would fall into a trance. Now, what's interesting, in Corinthian area, area, people would participate in this, and they would end up speaking in these languages, and gibberish and languages and different things, right? And Paul is as tongues. In this part of Greece and Macedonia, it's fortune-telling. But behind both groups of people was demonic forces. Okay? That's what's happening here. And so this woman, what would happen is she would whirl, she would dance, she would get into a type of a trance-like state, and she would tell people their fortune because she had been enslaved by evil men. They would charge you, and, they, and there you go. That's what's happening there. And isn't it interesting that when she begins to proclaim things about Paul, She's right. What does she say about them? These are servants of the most high God proclaiming the way of salvation. How about that? Isn't that interesting? But what she's doing is she's disrupting Paul and the ministry. Perhaps she was saying in a mocking way. Perhaps this was, you know, Paul and them viewed this as Satan trying to infiltrate in their message and, uh, and attach demonic you know, uh, association by infiltration, whatever, he had enough. And he cast the demon out. And her deliverance implies her salvation. You very much here have a, a story very similar to what you see in the gospel with Jesus and the demoniac of, Ge- of, of Gesserine or Garrison. Remember that story? Here's a man, he's filled with demonic beings, so bad that people, whenever they would travel the roads, he'd beat them to a bloody pulp. Finally, Jesus comes, casts the demons out. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, the demons are, they don't want to be cast out into the water or wilderness. And so they say, will you throw us into the pigs? He does. And then the pigs run into the water and they're all destroyed. And the villagers, when they come back around and they see this man who'd been naked, brutalizing them for years, and now they see him dressed and he's at the feet of Jesus. He's been converted. He's eating. He's in his right mind. He's healthy. And instead of celebrating and throwing a party, they're angry because their source of income with the pigs has now been drowned in the lake. Remember that story? You have something very similar here. The masters, they don't take kindly to her deliverance and salvation. Instead, they drag Paul and Silas before the magistrates and they lie. They play on the patriotic nature of the Philippians. Philippi is a Roman colony. What this means is they had been given a special status by the emperor. Roman soldiers were encouraged upon retirement to move to places like Philippi. There were tax benefits and other benefits. And and it was a, a city, a strategic city in the Roman Empire. And so this place was very loyal to the emperor. So these guys, they bring Paul and Silas before them into the public square where the magistrates would sit and rule, and they come before him and they say, these Jews are trying to destroy our Roman way of life just as they do everywhere. So they, they play upon the anti-Semitism of the day, and they play upon the patriotism of the people. They work up the mob 
the magistrates don't investigate. They don't give them a trial. They just have them beaten by the lictors who with their rods and their sticks, that's where you get that phrase, getting your licks in, the lictor, right? And they're bloody and they're beaten and they're thrown into the deep uh, jail, dungeon, deep portion of that. And that brings us to the third story, the desperate Roman jailer. Clearly, the jailer gets the message that these guys are high value targets. He puts them in stocks, very uncomfortable. Legs are spread out. They're sitting straight up. They can't lay down because of their bloody backs, stinky, unsanitary, horrible place. And there they sit. They don't have a pity party. They don't whine and cry. Instead, they begin to worship God. And you know what happens. We read it just a few moments ago. The earthquake begins. God frees, opens up the jail cells, frees them from their stocks. After this night of worship and praying and witnessing and proclaiming the goodness of God, the jailer comes in. He sees the open doors and he determines that he's going to commit suicide. Why? He was probably a retired Roman soldier. He's now a civil servant coming to law enforcement. He knows what's facing him, the pain and the indignity, most of all, the shame that will come upon his family and so by his execution. So instead, he does what would be considered the honorable thing in that culture, and that is kill himself, save his family, the shame. But before he can do so, Paul and Silas stop him. And then, verse 30, the jailer brings them out and he asks the question that everybody should ask. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And the passage goes on to tell us that he brings them out and he fixes their wounds and bandages them and feeds them and he's baptized and the household rejoices. What an incredible story of what happens here. All three stories, this early church, what an incredible, what a, what, a, what a core group for this church plant. Think about this core group for a moment. What great stories and that show how the gospel has the power to change people from such diverse backgrounds. In fact, that's, that's our takeaway truth this morning. The first of some gospel applications that I want us to think about. Regardless of our sin, regardless of our social status, if we trust in Jesus alone, we will be saved. That Roman soldier, excuse me, and then jailer, family man, providing for his family, wanting to know what? I've heard about you. I heard what happened to you, and I, I, I see what you did in the prison. You're unlike all the other prisoners. You're singing, and you're worshiping, and you're praying. What is it? What do I have to do to be saved? And they, they give him that gospel message. All kinds of people believe in Jesus. Churches, not just believing that Jesus existed. Notice that they proclaim to him all the, the message of God. The next verse is important there. Perhaps they took him like to what he says, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, and they explained how Jesus lived that life that we are to live and that he died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried, he rose again and ascended, and one day he'll come back. Maybe it was more like Romans 10, where he says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then we will be saved. Perhaps that's how they explained it, but all of it comes back to this idea of believing, trusting in Jesus as he has been presented to us in the gospel. How has he been presented? Lord, God in the flesh. He is our Lord. He's our King. He's our Savior. To trust in Jesus by faith. We don't make Jesus Lord. Jesus is already Lord. Salvation is us confessing that and acknowledging that and saying, Jesus, you are Lord and you have the allegiance of my heart. I'm depending on you. I want to follow you. I want you 
to be my savior. That's the story of salvation, and it's open to everyone. And this, this, these stories are so awesome. You may be like that young woman, and your story is filled with pain and abuse, a horrible backstory. And yet the gospel brings salvation and restoration so that the ending of your story is a story of hope and restoration and glory to God. You may have the story of a, of a widow, the pain that's associated with that, and yet having made something out of your life due to your work and your ability to, to do business and make money and, and have success by worldly standards, the gospel is still needed for you. Or a family man who wants to raise his children and be a good father and a dad, yet that's not enough to be a good father and a good dad because no man is saved by his good works. Our goodness does nothing but condemn us because all of our goodness is nothing but filthy rags. See that application in this story this morning. Regardless of who we are, who we've been, if we trust in Jesus alone, we will be saved. And if you don't know Jesus for certain as your savior, at the close of the service, come see us at the care area. We have people who can help you better understand what this means. Another application. For those of you who are Christians, our most effective ministry will often occur as we worship and obey God in the midst of trials and tribulations. You know, next week, Palm Sunday, Brian's going to bring the message. I think it's probably Brian's last message with us before he goes and becomes pastor of Lake Baldwin. So make sure you're here and support him. Looking forward to hearing it. And then we'll have Good Friday and an Easter. You know, all of this reminds us of Jesus' earthly ministry. You think about what happened leading up to that cross on Good Friday and how much this demonstrates this, this application from the passage Jesus goes through all of the trial, the tribulation, the persecution and opposition that takes place throughout his ministry, but culminating in Holy Week in his trial and, and then ultimately his death on the cross. He does all of this out of obedience and love to his heavenly father. And in the midst of that trial and tribulation, as he obeys God, he experiences the most effective portion of his ministry because it is there that he purchases our redemption and he accomplishes it. Our most effective ministry is often seen in the midst of trials and tribulations because that's when we obey God and serve him. When we do this in that time, so trials and tribulations, persecutions and oppositions, these things are not accidents. These are divine appointments. And our response to them is important. They're intentional. God brings them into our lives for a reason. They sanctify us, first of all. He's using them for our good to conform us into the image of Christ. Peter will say that after we have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called us to eternal glory in Jesus Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So certainly trials and tribulations and oppositions and persecution as we obey and worship God in the midst of these things, God sanctifies us with those trials and persecutions and tribulations. But there is a second reason that these things are divine appointments. And you see that in this passage, that God uses these things and these events in our lives for the good of others and for the growth of his kingdom. Paul will say to the Thessalonians, just down the road where he will go pretty quickly after leaving Philippi, Though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. The conflict is what produces the opportunity to proclaim the gospel. It is God teeing it up for souls to be saved. 
He will say to the Philippians later in his life, when he is again sitting in a prison, this time in Rome as he's facing perhaps his own death, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has already served to advance the gospel. So our most effective ministry will often occur as we worship and obey God in the midst of trials and tribulations. This passage reminds us that God is sovereign when we are unjustly treated or when we are in the literal or metaphorical dungeons of life. And rather than whining and doubting or cowering in fear or running away from it, this passage is encouraging us, telling us it's so much better to to worship God, to obey God and boldly proclaim the gospel when someone is curious as to why we can actually have hope in the difficult storms of life. It's an important application here. An important application in this passage. When you trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there is going to be some obvious evidence of our salvation. Did you notice in this passage that when Lydia, when the jailer come to Christ, it's obvious that they came to Christ, right? They're baptized. There's joy, joy, not gloominess, not so tired of Christians or such an oxymoron. I'm a Christian, okay? The fruit of the Spirit is joy. It's praising God and it's, it's that's, that's part of it. And there's this change in their lives and, and they open up, their, there's hospitality, they open up their homes, they feed the, the men of God, they treat their wounds. Think about the, the, wow, talk about a change for the slave girl. No more demon possession, freedom, freedom from the bondage of sin, a new destiny. Can I ask you a question? What's your proof? What's your proof? If someone were to say, are you a Christian? And you say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Oh yeah? Prove it. What's your proof? How would you answer that question? Is it the fruit of the Spirit? Can you talk about how you used to be and now you see this fruit in the Spirit in you? Is it, is it new heart attitudes that weren't there? Or new heart attitudes that are growing? Humility that's growing? More consciousness of sinfulness and need of God's grace? It, it, is it works like hospitality and mercy and justice and evangelism, different things that, and it's coming out of that new heart attitude of love for God. What's your proof? Please don't tell me your proof is, well, I've been a member at Covenant for 30 years. That's not proof. That's not proof. Three great gospel stories, three great applications of the gospel. It's only 11.30. One sober warning. One sober warning in this passage. Verse 19 says, When her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. It wasn't for patriotism. And it wasn't because they were turning, you know, Roman things. It was about the money, right? We, you got that, right? Here's the sober warning. This is good for those of you who are not Christians, those of us who are Christians. The love of money has eternal consequences. In the middle of all these salvation stories, you have an anti-salvation story. I mean, the owners of this demon-possessed girl they have the gospel proclaimed right in front of them. They see the power demonstrated in the most vivid way. 
They see that de this demon-possessed girl delivered, and yet what did they do? They reject the messengers, and they reject the message, and why did they do that? Because it was costing them money. They loved money and the things of this world and what that represented more than they did the security for their eternal souls. How tragic. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul will say, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For those of you maybe who do not believe this morning, maybe for those of you who are Christians who are struggling in your Christian walk and it just seems like you don't go anywhere, let me just ask you, is it the love of money? Is it the love of things of this world? Maybe is it the love of what the things that money and the things of this world will give you, the pride of life, the significance? Is it the love of those things and what they will get you that is in some way affecting your allegiance to Jesus or your willingness to submit to Jesus and receive him and trust in him as Lord and Savior? Is that going on in your life? If so, hear the warning of this passage that those things and the love of those things, they will condemn your soul. Turn away. Embrace our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for this passage, the stories of salvation that are there and the way they inspire the warnings that are there. Lord, I pray for the ones who may hear my voice this morning who don't know you. May you open their hearts the way you did Lydia's so that as they've heard this message this morning, they would confess to you their sinfulness, their need for forgiveness would you give them that gift of faith to trust in Jesus and to profess their allegiance to him as Lord? And Lord Jesus, would you do a work in all of our hearts? Would you help us to embrace not only the gospel, but the opportunities to proclaim it even in the midst of trials and tribulations? We thank you for dying for us, Lord Jesus, as we go into our holy week. All that that represents. What a good, good Savior you are. That friend who sticks closer than a brother. In your name we pray, amen.